Good morning. Welcome to the Feast of Tabernacles. Wow. Woo. Wow. Some commandments are obeyed better than others. And so God said to come here to rejoice, and I hear a lot of rejoicing going on already. What a wonderful thing it is to be gathering together to celebrate the great Feast of Tabernacles, the feast that God had commanded that uh, we should come together and celebrate here for eight days, and that's what we're here to do, and just to uh, enjoy one another's fellowship and company. And uh, let's begin today by turning to the uh, book of uh, Deuteronomy in chapter 16. This has already been read here, but I want to read it again because it, these verses are so important. It's, it's so amazing how there are things that are so simple, concepts that are so simple, but that are so deep and so profound when we look at it. And as we come here to meet for the Feast of Tabernacles, we are here to have a good time. We are here to celebrate. We are here to rejoice because God has caused, called us to a celebration together where we should come and celebrate because he is hosting a party for us because of the things that he is doing through his son, Yeshua the Messiah, Jesus the Christ, that he is bringing about this great plan of redemption and this time that there will be a gathering in of all who are his. There will be a separating of the wheat and the chaff and God will be dwelling among us forever for the tabernacle of God will be among men. And he will dwell with us, and we will be his children. And when you think about the promises and the prophecies that God has laid out, we are here to think about God and what he has set out to accomplish and what he is accomplishing. And our hearts should be filled with just great joy because of what God is doing and that he's opened our minds. He's opened our lives. He's given us life that we can see it because he wants us to be a part of it. And so that joy comes out when we look at God. Notice this in Deuteronomy 16, verse 13. It says, You shall observe the Feast of Tabernacles seven days when you have gathered from your threshing floor and from your winepress. And you shall rejoice in your feast, you and your son and your daughter, your male servant, your female servant, the Levite, the stranger, the father, this, the widow, who are within your gates. Seven days you shall keep a sacred feast to the Lord your God in the place which the Lord your God chooses because the Lord your God will bless you in all your produce and in all the work of your hands so that you surely rejoice. So see, as Scott was saying in the offertory, that it's not so much a matter of, you know, is, is God changing how much he gives and how generous his heart is and what he's doing? It's not so much a matter that God is changing. It's a matter that we're noticing and seeing. We're seeing the glory of God. We're seeing the honor of God. We're seeing the love of God, his grace and abundance. And we're seeing it, and it's filling us with joy. Amen. The joy comes because we acknowledge what he says. He says, I will bless you. And we're acknowledging the blessings of God. We're acknowledging who he is and what he is setting forth to accomplish. And because of what he's setting forth to accomplish, he says, you're going to rejoice. Because the things that God are, is doing are great. They're worthy of our praise. They're worthy of our attention. And, and God will receive that attention and praise at this feast site. So you shall surely rejoice. Verse 16, three times in a year, all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses. Now, it's interesting about choosing. Remember when Jesus was at, with the woman at the well, and, and he's, she was talking about they worship you know, here on this mountain, and you Jews worship in Jerusalem. And Jesus said, the time's coming. You'll neither worship here on this mountain or in Jerusalem. For God is spirit. And those who worship him must, must worship him in spirit and truth. And God is seeking such to be worshiping him in spirit and in truth. And as we come here to this feast, we gather not in our own name or in the name of Rock Valley we gather in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, Lord. We gather in the name of Yeshua the Messiah, the one to give him the glory, to give him the praise, to give him the honor. And it is our honor to be here, to be called to a meeting where his name is what brings us together. And so to understand that and, and to come with this heart. So he said that at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the Feast of Weeks, and at the Feast of Tabernacles... And they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. Every man shall give as he is able, according to the blessing of the Lord your God, 
which he has given you. If you're taking notes, I want you to write that down. Everyone gives as they are able. Everyone gives as they are able. When you think about the Feast of Tabernacles and you think about the wonderful truth of Jesus Christ coming to tabernacle among us, as it says in John 1, that he was giving as he was able. The very heart and essence of the command is something that comes from God's heart, that as God sees his ability, as God sees through his son what he can accomplish, these are the things he does and these are the things that he gives. And when you think about what God does for us, what did God not give to us? When you think of the big things of life, well, you, you want to have life. We're here because God gave us life. Amen. You want to know your place. God gives us a name and a place. He adopts us to be his children. God gives us calling. God gives us a hope. God gives us his love. Yes, yes. See, everything that we humanly desire and need to thrive in life, to have a culture and a place in life by which we can be successful and be the people God made us to be, God's saying, I'm going to provide that atmosphere for you. I want to provide it so that you are in a place of peace, that you're in a place of God, where there's quietness in the heart and there's joy in the spirit because of what God is doing and because of who God is and what he has set forth to accomplish. No one can stop. Not a trial, not a tribulation, not a persecution, not a distress. What can separate us from the love of God? And so when we come here, what we are acknowledging and what we are saying is there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God. There is nothing that can stop us. And we get enveloped into that. And God is saying, I want you to be enveloped in my love, in my joy, in my purpose, and in my plan. It's so easy sometimes to go through this walk and get so distracted by the things that are going on around us in this world or in our own personal lives or our own personal hurts and injuries and things. And, and friends, they are genuine hurts and injuries. But what God is teaching us is something of a walk of faith where in the midst of the trial and the storm, in the midst of the things that we face in our lives, that we know he is there. And when we feel the pain and we feel the hurt, and when the distress is all around, and people are crying out and we're crying out, we can lift up our heads and look up because redemption is drawing near. Our God is so engaged in our lives. He so wants to be involved in every part. And he wants us to be fellowshipping with him. And it's at this special time of the year, this Feast of Tabernacles, they say, I want you to come and I want you to celebrate with me. I want you to celebrate. I want you to rejoice because of what I've done. And I want you to come ready to give. Everyone gives as they are able according to the blessing of the Lord. You realize how awesome this is that we come together with the opportunity to live as his children away now from our work, away from our normal lives that we have in this world and the things that are going on and just to celebrate with God. And he wants you to celebrate. He wants you to rejoice, and he wants you to give. Turn with me just a couple chapters back here to Deuteronomy chapter 14. Deuteronomy chapter 14. Notice in verse 22, it says, You shall surely tithe of all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain and your new wine and your oil, of the firstborn of your herds and your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. Do you get that? Yes, to, to tithe of what you're doing, to come and to eat before the Lord, to come to the place and to acknowledge, you gave me all this stuff. I don't have anything of myself. I am acknowledging you are the God who blesses me with everything. That we may learn to fear the Lord, that we would acknowledge that there's nothing of us that is of us. That he is the creator, and we are the created thing. And it is such an honor and a privilege to come before God and say, blessings to you, praise to you. 
that we would come and give as we are able, according to the blessing of God, to bless God and to bless the people that are in this room. Is your heart ready to give? Is your heart ready to celebrate? To rejoice? He says, if the journey is too long for you, verse 24, so that you're not able to carry the tither, if the place where the Lord your God chooses to put his name is too far from you, when the Lord your God has blessed you, then you shall exchange it for money. Take the money in your hand, go to the place which the Lord your God chooses, and you shall spend that money on whatever your heart desires. For oxen and sheep, for wine or similar drink, whatever your heart desires, you shall eat there before the Lord your God, and you shall rejoice, you and your household. And you shall not forsake the Levite who is within your gates, for he has no part nor inheritance with you. And so at the end of every third year, you shall bring out the tithe of your produce of that year and store it up within your gates. And the Levite, because he has no portion nor inheritance with you, and the stranger and the fatherless and the widow who are within your gates may come and eat and be satisfied that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hand which you do. Take it up. Take my blessing and come to share it, to rejoice in the blessing of it, in the amazement of how God has been so good, and give it to others. How many of you, is this is your first time here at a Rock Valley Feast site? All right. There's a, all right, everybody, wait, I, I, I need you to, I need you, I need your hands higher. I want everybody who's been here before to look at the people with their hands up. I need the people that haven't been before. Keep your hands up. Everybody who's been here before, look at the people. This is their first time. Okay? They're new here. What do the saints do when new people come around? Love them and welcome them and rejoice. Brainerd, I don't, you may need to put your hand down. You're too, you, you, Brainerd came in and he was family the moment he got to the, the church. We just sit in the front, Brainerd, and he just took over and uh, it's, it's, been, it's been wonderful. The, the amount of joy and the amount of uh, enthusiasm for the Lord, you just love it. But look it, there are people that aren't as outgoing as Brainerd who are more shy, who are more on the outskirts in this group. I challenge everybody here who goes to Rock Valley Christian Church that we who get to fellowship together every week to make it your mission to come to this feast, to give as you are able to everyone that you don't get to see from week to week. So I'm calling on everybody who comes to Marietta every week, I want you to look at everyone else in this room. And for this week, I'm challenging you, make it your mission to demonstrate the love and goodness of God to every person in this room. And if you're here for the first time, be a Brainerd. Brainerd comes in and he just starts hugging everybody. We welcome you. We love that you're here. We love that you've come to celebrate the feast. Be here to give your gift too. Be here to give fellowship to one another, to give care to one another, to give love to one another. Because this is the heart and essence of what God is saying, that I'm going to bless you. I want to give to you. I want you to have it and then take it up. I want you to travel and come together. I want you to eat and drink and be satisfied together because you're celebrating the fact that you're my kids and my family that you are my children, and I take care of my children, and I bless my children, and I love my children because they bless and take care of one another. And by this, all men shall know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. And in this place, of all places, of all times, whoever you are in this room, I challenge you, make this a time of giving to one another and to giving to those who you don't. You know, we have widows here. We have strangers here. We have fatherless here. We have people that are in need here. We have people that are shy. If you see somebody on the fringe, you get them right in. And you rejoice with them. And you know how easy it is? Spend time together. The fellowship of God. The fellowship that you can give to others. So look outside of your normal friends, your normal groups, your normal family circles. Look to others that are in this room. And let this be an awesome and a glorious and a blessed time. Turn over with me to Exodus chapter 35. Exodus chapter 35. 
Because the offering I'm asking you to give is an offering that every man should give as he is able. But notice this, when there was an offering being taken up, what God said and how often he emphasizes this, in Exodus chapter 35, and notice here beginning in verse 4, Exodus 35, 4, it says, Moses spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commanded. Take from among you an offering to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart, let him bring it as an offering to the Lord, gold, silver, and bronze, blue, purple, and scarlet thread, fine linen, and goat's hair, ram skins dyed red, badger skins, and acacia wood, oil for the light and spices for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense, onyx stones and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate. And so he lays out here all the offering that he's asking him to give. So he's doing it, but he says, let those who are of a willing heart bring forth this offering. And so, and then he says in verse 10, the gifted artisans among you come and they make all that the Lord has commanded, the tabernacle, the ten, and, and on it goes. And so notice then, it says in verse 20, after Moses lays out, so here's what we need. We need all these things for the tabernacle, for the tent, for the meeting place, all the uh, furniture and the clothing and everything. And it said, and all the congregation of the children of Israel departed from the presence of Moses. Verse 20, then everyone came whose heart was stirred and everyone whose spirit was willing And they brought the Lord's offering for the work of the tabernacle of meeting for all its service and for the holy garments. Friends, think about what these next eight days can be in this place as we gather together. If everyone comes ready of a willing heart to give of the things that God has blessed them with to share with other people here in this place the goodness of God. There won't, the, the command to rejoice will just come out of that because you're here to serve, you're here to give as God has given to you. But what does it require of us? It requires a willing heart. It requires being stirred of heart. That this is not a time just for self, that this is a time for sharing and that the way that I will receive is not by going to get, but by going to give. And this is the way of life that guides us as a church, as a people, that there is a heart of giving and service that God is looking for in each of us to see who is it that will bring forth the offerings to me, that will put it together. And as you and I come, we all come from different places and different walks. We have different jobs. We have different gifts. We have different talents. This is a time to prepare to use those things that God has given you to share it with others. You know, sometimes we can go and come to a Feast of Tabernacles and say, I just want to chill this year. I just don't want to do anything. And I'm just talking about my house. It's, you know, say, <laughs> Italy sounds real good right now. You know what? There's no place I'd rather be than right here because this is the time to share the gifts. This is the time to give of yourself and your service to one another and to rejoice before God because of the goodness. That's why he, he commanded that you would bring forth an offering to give. It's really easy when you think about what God is asking for. What is it that makes for a successful Feast of Tabernacles? Singing, praising, praying, loving, sharing your food, sharing your drink, opening up your your condo or taking out to a restaurant, just being together and sharing your life with somebody else. These are the things that God has wanted from the beginning. Everything that God has done, everything that he's blessed us with is that we can come together with fellowshipping and sharing and giving. And this is the perfect environment for us to come and say, God, be among us. God, be in us. God, bless us. Help us to see those who might be hurting here. Help us to see those who might be more shy. Help us to include and to encompass the people with your love, that I will be like your servant here to give love. You've called for an offering, and I come wanting to give. And God says, for everyone who's willing, for everyone who's stirred up, bring this gift, bring it. And they did. And so they came, verse 22, both men and women, as many as had a willing heart. And that's who I'm calling out to. 
All of you who are of a willing heart to give, I'm calling to you saying, how are you going to give? And I'm not just talking to the adults, young people, teenagers, kids. There are people around here that also need love and care and service. It's not just old people. It's young people. It's young adults. To include, to be inclusive of, to be thoughtful about. I'm challenging you to come in the very spirit and essence of fellowship that God our Father wanted from the beginning. That in your heart, you are on a mission from God to bless and give as you are able as God provides a way for you to give at this feast. And I know that we will have a wonderful eight days of celebration if we do this and we give. So it says that they brought everyone who had a willing heart, verse 22, brought earrings and nose rings and necklaces and jewelry. That is, every man who made an offering of gold to the Lord and every man with whom was found blue and purple and scarlet thread, fine linen and goat's hair, red skins and rams and badger skins brought them. And everyone who offered an offering of silver or bronze brought it. And everyone with whom was found acacia wood for any of the work brought it. Whatever they had. Somebody's got stones. Somebody's got linen. Somebody's got some thread. Somebody's got gold. Somebody's got silver. It says whoever had it, whose heart was willing, they brought it. But not one person brought everything. But everybody brought something. What did you bring? What did you bring to give? See, the part that you have is, is awesome, and it's exactly what God wants for you to bring to this place is what you have to give. So we're calling for an offering to serve the people in this room. That's pretty wide. How are you going to do that with your money and your time and where you're staying while you're here? That's what God wants to see. What is the heart? And so it says, all the women that were gifted, artisans, spun yarn with their hands because that's what they could do. They knew how to take the yarn and, and use it for purposes. They brought it, they spun it purple, blue, uh, blue, purple, scarlet, and fine linen. And all the women whose hearts stirred with wisdom spun yarn of goat's hair. Like Stephanie was saying, we got all these wonderful, talented people that are helping us and serving back at the information table. Thank you, Brenda. And everyone who helps her. Doug, you too. And, and notice, the, the rulers brought onyx stones, verse 27, and stones to be set in the ephod and in the breastplate and spices and oil for the light, for the anointing oil and for the sweet incense. The children of Israel brought a freewill offering to the Lord all the men and women whose hearts were willing to, be material, uh, to bring material for all kinds of work which the Lord, by the hand of Moses, had commanded to be done. And then Moses said, look, the Lord has called uh, by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and he has filled him with the spirit and the wisdom and understanding and the knowledge of all manner of workmanship. And he goes on to say, and not only... Did all the, the physical gifts get brought in? But those who were talented, God gave a spirit of wisdom of how to work with the materials. And this one was set apart. And, and Moses said, not only was he set apart by name by God, but he had the ability to do pretty much anything with any material for artisan work. And not only that, he had the ability to teach others how to do it so that they could put it together. And so... When you think about how the tabernacle came together, God did it by people putting forth and offering everyone giving from what God had blessed them with, whether of gold or silver or the linen or the materials, the yarn, everything. That's the way the tabernacle got put together and people bringing an offering and sharing it together and working it together. And you realize that this is what makes being a child of God and a part of the family of God such a wonderful and honorable place to be. When he says, they will do no harm in all my holy mountain. To know that the people that are coming to God have a heart that is wanting to give as they are able. Isn't it beautiful how we, we trust that of God? We trust because he is able, he's willing to give the things with which he is able to give us. 
you realize that it's at the core of our faith in God that we not only know that he can do, but that he will do, that he wants to do. Because all God is doing when he says, every man shall give as he is able, he's expressing a part of his heart that as he has the ability to give, he does because he can and he wills to give. Turn with me over to John chapter 4. John chapter 4. John chapter 4. Notice with me here in John chapter 4 and verse 5. It says, So he, that is Jesus, came to a city of Samaria, which is called, oh, my eyes are just getting bad, Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there, and Jesus therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. So it's important to know the context. Jesus, is, he's tired out. He's had a long journey, and he's like, guys, you go on. I'm, I just need to sit and take a load off. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sit here. So a woman of Samaria came to draw water, verse 7. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. So kind of an interesting beginning to a conversation, isn't it? Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. So the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. So there was an impact to him asking her for something. That he was asking her. And she noted it. And Jesus answered and said, If you knew the gift of God, If you knew the gift of God. If you knew the gift of God. Just let that sink in. If you knew the gift of God. What is his gift? How awesome is his gift? How enriching and deep is his gift? If you knew the gift of God. Because God already knows that what every person is thirsting and hungering for in life is the gift. It's the gift that answers the questions of life. It's the gift that gives the power, the wisdom, the understanding, the intelligence, everything that comes from God. If you knew the gift and everything that we can see in the scriptures and every way that he binds us together as a church, it comes from the gift that God is looking to give to those who know the gift. And so he says, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Did you notice that? If you knew the gift and you knew who was talking to you, you would ask, and the the assumption in Jesus' mind, what is it? I would have given it to you. The assumption is that because he has the gift, and because of who he is, knowing him, that we would receive the very thing that we ask him for. Now, friends, in the heart of who God is, in the heart of all this giving as you are able, in the heart of what God is there is an absolute assumption that we make, but it's based on a promise of God that because he has it, when we come knowing that he has it, and we come knowing who he is, if we ask for it, he says, you receive it. Was there any doubt in what he said? I might have thought about it. Maybe I'd give it to you. If you were lucky, I might have felt generous at that moment. Because here he is, tired and worn out. Here he is wanting to sit. Here he is asking for water, talking and engaging in the Samaritan woman that comes. And as they enter in conversation, he immediately begins to do what? 
saying, here's this woman, this Samaritan woman. Here she is coming to the well. Here she is saying, why are you interacting with me? Why are you even acknowledging me? Jews don't acknowledge a woman like me, let alone a Samaritan. But I mean, not, let, alone a Samaritan, uh, let alone a woman like me. Here I am. He's talking to me. And Jesus immediately lets her know the gift, who he is. And if you knew, you would ask and you would receive. See, the issue with where faith is in life is not only in knowing about the gift, it's knowing, in the, knowing the one who gives the gift. Amen. Jesus said, oh, let's just read it again. Let's just, let's just burn this in our hearts and minds. Verse 10, if you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you a drink. Living water. Isn't that wonderful? Every man shall give as he is able according to the blessing of the Lord your God. God wants to bless. God is ready to bless. God desires to bless. It's who he is. The generosity of God is a constant of his character. So you don't have to wonder when, when, when God is holding forgiveness for you and, and, and you've sinned and transgressed against the Lord. When you come before God and you know the gift of his forgiveness and you know who it is who you come to and ask and you say, Father, Lord Jesus, please forgive me. When you know the gift of forgiveness and the one who can give, you know that you've received the very thing because he's ready to give. We have a disconnect in society where we think we can be asking and not receiving and all this doubt and this wonder, well, would you be generous with me? Would you give to me? And underneath this, in the culture of our family, the family of God is there is a culture of belief and faith and confidence in who God is and what the gifts of God are, the promises that he revealed that we can come and ask him for anything in Jesus' name and we will receive it. Do you believe that? Amen. Or has the time between the asking and the receiving dulled the senses and dulled the faith? Because what is happening is not that God is not faithful, but he is working out and he says, I I'm going to make you hunger. I'm going to make you thirst because I want to know what's in your heart. When you're asking for something, is it because you are of a willing heart? And is it because you have a spirit stirred up that you're ready to give? What is the reason? He says, you ask and you do not have. You covet and you cannot attain. Why? Because you ask to spend on your own pleasure. Here we come to a feast where God says, I want you to spend for whatever your heart desires. I want you to spend for whatever you want. And the question is, is your heart wanting? Are you coming here to say, what am I going to give? It is more blessed to give than to receive. The feast becomes a greater blessing by giving. So as you come here, you may think, I'm just going to come here and take it in. And for some of you, that's exactly what you need to do to allow others to give to you. But I assure you that the more you start to receive in gifts and the more you appreciate the blessings that you've been given, the more your heart with God will churn to say, I need to give, to give. So Jesus goes on and he says, so the woman said, sir, you have nothing to draw with. And the well is deep. Where then do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? And Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of this water will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. I'll read that again. 
Whoever drinks of the water that I give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Turn over just a few pages here to John chapter 7 and verse 37. John chapter 7 and verse 37. On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this is something about God that I just totally love. If you're thirsty, he says, I don't want to just give you a cup for the moment. I don't want to just put enough in to satisfy what's going on inside. I want to give you something that's going to go out. A fountain of life springing out. Rivers of living water flowing out. This is one of the amazing things about God. When you look at the miracles and the things that happen. So there are three nations coming against Judah. And they don't know what to do because of the nations that are coming against them and besieging them. And they cry out to God and they fast and they, they look to him saying, save us, O God. And the prophet comes and says, the battle's the Lord's. You don't have to fight this one. Because when the battle came to the people and they were scared and fearful for their lives because three nations were gathering against them to come against them to do harm, they looked to God. And you see, in all of this, where, what is God trying to get us to see? He's trustworthy. He's honorable. You can rely on him. And God, through all of our lives and through all this journeying and all this tabernacling you and me do on this earth, what God is saying is, you're tabernacling, let me tabernacle with you. And so God gets excited when you come to him and say, give me the drink. I need the drink. And when they came and they fasted and humbled themselves before God, what did he do? He said, it's my battle. You made it my battle. I, your God, will defend you and protect you. Amen. So what happens? They go forth and the armies are still there, but what do they do? They start singing and praising. It's a 2 Chronicles 20, by the way, I think. 2 Chronicles 20. But the, they start going forth and what happens? God turns two of the nations against one and then after they take care of the one, they turn on each other. And now you have this million and a half, I think, man army out there that was encamped to come against Judah. And now the, not only is the problem gone, but it said it took days for them to clean up all the stuff, the gold, the silver, the animals, and everything that that army just brought to Israel, brought to the tribe of Judah. God has a habit of this. God likes to take a problem and leave a blessing on the other side. God likes to take where we are and bring us to someplace new. And right now what we're celebrating at the Feast of Tabernacles is the point of it. What's he do? Trumpets, we talk about the return of the king. We talk about the judgments. We come to a point in a day of fasting where we humble ourselves before the Lord, where we're afflicting ourselves before the Lord, and he's cleansing us so that he can leave a blessing behind. So we come into this feast after having fasted and turned to God with seeking to come here now to fix our eyes on him and to celebrate and rejoice. 
God's intention is not just to get us out of the problem. God's intention is to teach us through the problem that we learn to fear the Lord through all that we go through so that on the other side, we're not just back to even, we are in the blessing. If you want to see the power of God, it's not just about what God will do to the one, it's what God does to the many. Jesus Christ came and gave his life. When he was sacrificed, he died. And he rose again, but the life he now lives, he rose up for you and me that the very blessing of his life, not just to himself, but to everyone who comes and says, give me a drink. I am thirsty for you, God. The blessings that God works out in our lives is to be for somebody else. So when Jesus says, I want you to drink, if you need a drink, out of you is coming rivers of living water. I don't just want you to have it. I want you to be fully satisfied, but you're going to be so satisfied. You're going to be so gushing that what comes out of you to everybody else is living water. And isn't the prophecy that there would be these rivers of living water that would flow from the temple and that wherever the rivers would go, there would be blessing, that there would be life, that things would sprout up, that would spring up because of God. God wants you to be a gusher, a gusher for the Lord bringing forth these fountains of life, bringing forth this spirit that God has given to you, it can't be contained. Jesus didn't give the option for it to be contained. He said, if you want a drink, I'm going to give you a drink. And out of you is going to come rivers of living water. That's what he says. The satisfaction of God is that your life would be completely found in him and that just as he gives to others you would give to others every part of your life to be an offering willing to be ready to give to be ready to share to be rich on every occasion because we have been given such tremendous riches by God that we have so much to share with one another and friends this is the sweetness of fellowship this is the essence of the kingdom of God that we would know God and that we would be able to share. Notice, continuing on here now, uh, verse 38 again, let's just read it. So he who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water, just like the cup to the Samaritan woman. And notice, but this he spoke concerning the spirit, whom those believing in him that is the gift that those believing in him would receive for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. Now this is speaking of Jesus being raised from the dead, being restored to the glory that he had with the Father before the world was, as it says in John 17. But I want you to listen to what Jesus is saying and what is being said here and written in the book of John. That the Spirit, whom those believing in him, again verse 39, would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. I think the principle that John is expressing about Jesus being glorified is the same thing that is going on today in you and me. The believing comes out by giving him glory in everything. The believing comes out by giving God glory. See, in, in, in what do we look to in life for our sustenance, for our satisfaction, for our comfort. See, God has given us many wonderful gifts, foods and drinks and, and clothes and fun activities and all kinds of wonderful things. But ultimately, if that's all that is within us, those things run out. And the more you do them, the more they don't really seem to give you the help and excitement and the blessing and the fun that you think. But in the core of what's going on in this feast and what is going on in our lives is that God is saying, will you give him the glory? 
Will you bless him? Will you honor him? Will you see him in everything? You see, every decision that we make in our lives that brings about the things that God wants to see, it's a choice right there. Do I give God glory in this? When you make a decision at work, when you make a decision in the family, is God at the center? Is God being given the glory in your life, in my life, to say, this is where I need you? Because what is an acknowledgement of is, I'm thirsty right now, God. I am thirsty in this moment. And, and thirst can be a number of different things. I don't know in what way you might be thirsty, but I do know this, that if you are thirsty, there is one who has a great gift and one who wants to give the gift to you. Ask him. Ask him for the gift. Ask him for the gift and so give God glory. Give Jesus glory. He who honors the Son honors the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father. We will give glory to our Lord. For he is the way and the truth and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. It is he who went to the Father to be glorified that we would receive the Spirit. It is not a matter of whether he will give us the gift of God. It is not a matter of whether he wants to give us the gift of God, that he can give us the gift of God. The matter is, will we give him glory in our lives that the gift would come in, that we would believe in the one whom God has sent, and that we would give our lives to him here and now again, refreshing that there is no other way that we seek other than the way. His way, Jesus the Christ. In our lives, does he have the preeminence? The preeminence that takes us to the place of joy and rejoicing. For we see the blessings of God. And we give the blessings of God to one another. So what an awesome thing it is that we can come and we can learn through this feast, this important lesson, that God is good and gracious and giving. That he is the one who blesses us in all of our produce and all of our work. That he is the one that is giving to us so that we can learn to take of the things that he has blessed us with and pour them back out to others. Our lives are to be gushing forth with his spirit as rivers of living water coming. And all of that comes down to, do you believe in him? Will you give him the glory Will you give him first place in your life? That's what God wants. And that's what's going to make this an awesome feast. I cannot begin to express to you how much God loves you and God cares for you. And as his people, how much it should be our desire, our willingness to say, I want to give to you like I've been given to. So if you find yourself struggling with willingness and with a heart that seems unstirred, start thinking and thanking the God who has given you everything. Start taking account of everything that is good from him, of everything wonderful that you have, and let the joy of thanksgiving come into your heart and let the joy of what you received come into such fullness that you give him the glory and exit that prison of despair and depression and distress and anxiety and the cares of this world and all the things that can get you down because there is one God who rules and reigns forever and his desire is to rule and reign in our lives and let us give at this feast the King of Kings glory. Glory to the King of Kings. Who is this King of glory? Lift up your heads, O you gates. Lift up your heads, you ancient doors, and let the king of glory come in. Let the king of glory have place in our lives, and let the king of glory flow from us with gifts and giving and generosity. I got this, uh, this uh, bracelet. Joel and Leslie Bosserman, where are you guys? There you are. Woo! Bracelet's on. All right. This is so cool. So this bracelet, and we did not coordinate this. It just so happened. It's, it, but I saw this like, wow, this is awesome. Give. 
That's all it says is give. I said, take one note. Every man shall give as he is able. And she brought these bracelets, and it says, give this bracelet to a friend, family member, or even complete stranger who has recently gone out of their way to give. Follow the instructions inside and watch the bracelet get passed around your community, inspiring people to do good works. How many of these did you bring? I wonder how often they're going to get exchanged at this feast. <laughs> All over the place. Give. And you, you tell people when they, somebody gives to them, then you pass it on. Is that the instructions? Awesome. You don't, just tell them. Just pass it on. What an awesome thing. So these might have to start in this room or maybe right after services today, but let's see them all over. Pass on the giving spirit of God and pass on the bracelet to somebody else. Now, I have something to give. John Vonderhaar, John Vonderhaar stood up with me when I got married, and he always gets something from me. So here's the thing. We've talked about the rivers of living water and giving glory to God. Allison Gregorio, an artisan, she designed us another awesome shirt with the scripture, John 7, 37, uh, on the back. Or, uh, if anyone's thirst, let them come to me, and I will give them, and rivers of living water will flow. So if you registered for this feast, we have a shirt for you. It's a gift to you for coming, to wanting to celebrate, and this shirt, it, I just think it's awesome. A gifted artist in giving it. So, John, thanks, buddy. Thanks. Scott always knows he gets one, too. Everybody gets one. I just, you know, anytime I have a chance to give something to you, buddy. Hey, get down here, man. I, need a hug. I just like John's hugs better. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love you, I love you too, please. All right, so we have these at the information table. If you registered, pick up your shirt at the information table and get ready to celebrate and rejoice. We have this time right after to share a meal together. You don't need to go anywhere. Just go to the place where the food is being served. It's free for you. We want you to start enjoying and celebrating. Start sharing your gifts. Start sharing your lives. Start coming together as a family here at this Feast of Tabernacles, and let's celebrate for eight days.